I'd say this is more get to know Mel Tucker more than anything else. So obviously you played for a long time before you went into coaching. Tell me your earliest football memory of saying, man, I, f I love this sport. You fell in love with it. Oh, wow. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I don't ever remember making a conscious decision to play football. I mean, I think growing up in Ohio, if you're a boy, you play football. My dad played football in college at Toledo, and he raised me as a football player. I just remember back in the day, like at my grandmother's house, like we would watch the Browns play, and then we'd go in the backyard, and like someone would be Ozzie Newsome or Brian Sype or Ricky Feature or something like that, you know. Especially like it was be uh, Cleveland Pittsburgh, and then you know we take some rags out of the kitchen, had the terrible towels out there, and I mean that was really like what it was all about. Man, we lived, lived for those Browns games. You would, you would uh, turn the volume down on the TV and and watch it on TV, but listen to it on the radio. And then after the game, hit the backyard, and, and that's that's when really when I fell in love with the game. Yeah, you're speaking my language now. You're saying you're going deep dive broadcast. That's broadcast 101. You see, this is why I like you, man. This is why we get along. <laughs> it's hard for every player to eventually decide, all right, playing career's over, let me move over. What made you decide to go into coaching or what made it feel like it was right for you? Yeah, when I decided that, that my playing days were over, I just kind of, I was back home in Cleveland, at Cleveland Heights, and I migrated to, up to my high school and I, I just volunteered. And I coached uh, football and then freshman basketball. And I just really enjoyed, and I coached a flag football team in the community. And I really, I really enjoyed coaching, but I wasn't making any money, so I had to go get a job. <laughs> but I still had that itch, and, and I, I, my agent, Neil Cornridge, was with me at the time. You know, I, I had gotten to know him when I was at Wisconsin, and we were just talking about it. He says, you know what? Um, there's a lot of opportunities right now for, for minority coaches. You'd be a great coach. You just got to get in the right situation. And he told me to think about it, and, and I called him. I said, yeah, I want to do it. And, uh, and I, you know, I called Nick Saban. He recruited me when I was in high school when he was the head coach at Toledo where my dad played. And he, he basically hired me over the phone, and that's what started for me in 1997. That's awesome. What, what kind of offensive sets were you running on the basketball court, though? How was that freshman <laughs> team that year? Yeah, we were, we, I was like an assistant coach, and we, we won a lot. I don't, think, I don't know if we even lost a game oh, that year. We had, we, had a great, we had a great team. We had a lot of, a lot of good players. Um, you know, we were, we were pretty much run and gun. Could you play is the real question. How were you on the basketball court? I feel I, like you had a jumper. I was solid. I mean, I had some small Division One offers. Nice. In basketball, coming out of high school, you know, my high school was really, like, really big in the basketball. But I had more opportunities in football, obviously. No doubt. No doubt. We got a chance to go to Wisconsin. I mean, that's hard to turn down, yeah, especially yeah. to play football over there. I'm always curious. I don't. I, we may have talked about this last year, but if not. When you play for a school and then now you're coaching at a separate one, but you're playing against that school, you know, you're in the same conference yeah. and you get to go back, which is great, but how are those emotions where you get to coach against the school that, that you had so much pride playing for? It was different like when I when I was a younger coach sure. and when I was coaching like at Ohio State and, you know, we played Wisconsin. Those emotions, you know, really kind of came up a lot more then. This is year 27 for me, you know, and so it always had a special place in my heart, you know, for the Badgers. But you know, it's, it's kind of gone beyond that, and it's it really is not it's not an emotional situation for me anymore. I know that you hear it all the time. You don't look like you'd be coaching 27 years. That skincare routine is elite. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, just continue it. I know you mentioned getting a real job. One of those being selling meat yeah. out of the trunk of your car. Yeah. I mean, just tell me about that because first of all, major respect, major, major <laughs> respect. That's the grind time of your <laughs> life, no doubt about it. But you think the kids now that you, you, you coach every day, every year, you think they understand like what you actually to go through? They have Amazon now, they could order whatever they want. There's no, no way, right? No, I, and I'm not sure how many of my players actually know that I did that. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, that was one of the best experiences of my life because you know, it was hardcore, door-to-door -door sales, no advertising, you know, just pick, pick any neighborhood, pull up in the driveway, you know, get out, go knock on the door, try to get in, try to, let, you know, let me, let me show you what I got. And, it, and my goal was to knock on 100 doors a day to empty the truck. And that was rain, snow, you know, it didn't matter. And anytime my pitch got stale, you know, I would go to a, go and get an ice cream cone, regroup and go back at it. But uh, tremendous experience and it made, once I got to college football and we started recruiting, I'm like, recruiting is a lot easier 
than selling food door to door in, on the streets of Cleveland. So uh, it really helped me. You read my mind. That's exactly where I was going. What, I guess, things that happen or things that players do make you feel the most proud as a coach? What's the thing you, you point to and say, man, that was awesome? Yeah, you know, I, I really enjoy helping players get better. And so, when, you know, when I sit down with a player or I'm on the field with them and I, and I show them, hey, this is what, this is how you do this and this is why. And then you know, we put them in a, in a situation in practice where they can actually do it and they get better. And then they come back and they want more. You know, that's, that's where that's the rush for me that's what that's what I'm addicted to that's what keeps me coming back and just to see the players have success you know when they take it on the field and into games and you know after the game they'll say yeah coach we talked about that or we'll sit in the meeting they'll look at me like yeah coach you see that I mean that's 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 very gratifying to me as a coach what traditions or things that you've created maybe just even the the culture that you've set do you rely on or do you look at and say this is the the Mel Tucker way of doing it yeah I, I think we take pride in not you know not having a lot of flair on our you know outside of our uniform you know we try to get away from the, the towels and the streamers and the wristbands and the, the bands around the calves and the, you know all that we you know, swag goes a long way yeah, it's, it's hard it's hard because you know they they want that you know but you know at the end of the day you know, my dad taught me that the name of the game is hit, and you, and you talk with your pads. And so all that stuff doesn't really matter. And so, um, you know, we pride ourselves on, on uh, not, you know, not being a non-flare football team. So along those lines, I know that you've talked about, and, and we were talking about last season, and how it didn't go necessarily the way you expected, especially the talent you had on the roster. But it's a building block now for this season and, and moving forward. And that's something you've really preached since you've gotten to East Lansing. Tell me about why you think this team can take what they did last year, build upon it, and show that legitimate improvement right away. Yeah, well, even starting with the coaching staff. I mean, last year it left a really bad taste in our mouth. I mean, it was a it was a very tough, challenging year, and uh, we weren't happy about it. And it was a humbling experience for all of us. And the players uh, have a chip on their shoulder. You know, when you don't win, it's not fun to play football when you're not winning. And uh, and you don't want to ever have that feeling again. And we worked really, really hard to recruit, to build the depth that we need on our team. We are developing the players that we have. We're bigger, we're stronger, we're faster. We have, a, we have the most talent on the roster that, that, that we've had since I've been there. And uh, so we're really excited about it. But we have an edge to us um, because of what happened last season. And we know there's no high expectations for us other than you know inside our building. And so uh, we're OK with that. I, I'm, again, I said it to you before, I'll say it again. I, I don't think people gave you guys enough credit for what you actually did last year, considering the injuries, considering the absences. To, to get the five wins that you did is incredibly impressive. Now the quarterback is the next question, the next step. We saw Noah a little bit last year in some action, and he looked pretty good. And he could throw the ball. He's got that mobility as well. What have you seen in the competition? How do you feel like that's a position that you guys can take another step in the right direction? You know, he's always looked good and uh, since, since his freshman year. He's got really good arm talent. He's mobile. He's got a really good demeanor. He doesn't get too high. He doesn't get too low. And he's really, really competitive. And that's what you have to have at that position. And he's an unselfish guy. And that's important because uh, we have good players around him. Uh, on offense and also on defense and special teams. You know, we're going to play complimentary football. So what we need our quarterback to do is just do your job and run the offense. You know, take what the defense gives you, do what you're supposed to do. If it's not there, throw it away or pull it down, run it, hit the check down, go to the next play. And, you know, he understands that. He's been around long enough that he knows that's how, that's a formula for winning. And I'm, I'm confident that he, he, he'll he get that done. And Caden Hauser, same type of guy, you know, very talented, very confident, can make all the throws. And those guys have a really healthy competition. Um, you know, I can't wait. We have 25 practices in camp before our first game, and I just can't wait to get started next week. Spoken like a defensive guy, which, by the way, again, nothing but respect for. How have you felt like you have developed your relationships with offensive players over the years, especially the quarterback position? Well, uh, Sam Levitt, our freshman quarterback, came to see me yesterday, and. Uh, and I was talking to him about uh, you know, some of the things that, were, that I was seeing over the summer. And he was like, you, you noticed that? You know that? I said, yeah, I've been watching you. And I, I get the reports. And I said, hey, I'm really going to be able to work with you more once we start camp, because I'll be right there every day. I said, I, in, in practice, I stand 
on the offensive side of the ball. He says, you do? I said, I'm right there with you the whole practice. I can see the defense there on the other side. I can see their eyes and I can coach them, but I like to stand on the offensive side. And he was like, wow, that's great. I said, I've coached against a lot of good quarterbacks. And we talked about, I said, I've coached against Tom Brady, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, you know, uh, you, you, you name it. Uh, you know, I've game plans, game plan against those guys. I know what a good quarterback looks like, so I'm going to help you. I'm going to be with you guys every step of the way. And um, I think just uh, me bringing a defensive perspective to those offensive guys when they ask me, "Hey, what do you got? What, what, what coverage was that?" And, and like, or, or if we do this, what are you guys going to do? What's your adjustment? Just explaining. Uh, the details and the why behind some of the schemes that they see, I think it brings a lot of value to those guys. You bring up a great point, and I feel like people don't even think about the fact that you had to game plan for some of the greatest names in the history of the sport. Was there ever a moment where you took the step back and you're like, I've never seen anyone do this before. <laughs> I've never seen a pocket presence this way, the wiggle of Brady, or you mentioned Breeze, those types of guys. Was there a moment for you that that stood out? Yeah, there's. Uh, it would happen. It would happen all the time because I would watch film preparing. I was like, wow. I mean, you run it back and say, how did he see that? How did he make that throw? How did he get rid of that ball? How did he know that that blitz was coming? You know, those guys are just you know amazing guys. Sam asked me, he said, who was the toughest guy? And I said, you know what? They were all tough. I said, but you know, like, like Peyton Manning, man, that guy, he, you know, he just was a killer. He just knew what you were in. Like he studied so much film. He was, I mean, like he was a, talking about a student of the game. He was like above and beyond that. And and I, he said, well, what about Brady? I said, Brady's the same way. I mean, those guys were just lethal guys. Roethlisberger, lethal guys. You know, I've seen a lot of, you know, I talked to him about Michael Vick. I said, I coached against Michael Vick. He said, what was the deal? I said, man, he take off running, and no one on the, no one on defense could catch him. He was the fast guy on the field, and he could throw the ball 70 yards in the air. You're like, how does it, how does a guy do that? I've, I've seen some some freakish things from some quarterbacks in the NFL. Yeah, no doubt. Now, that's that's almost unfair, by the way. If you're fastest guy and you throw 70 yards, you shouldn't be allowed to play. That should be a cheat code. And he dominated while he was, at, uh, yeah, while he was in his Yeah, 100%. Uh, one of the guys you mentioned looking at the offense, one of your studs, Trey Mosley. Yeah. When I say Trey Mosley, yeah. what comes to mind? The best. He's like the best guy. Like He's like the, a great young man. I mean, he's like super classy. He's, he's grown into a leader. He's very dependable, I and mean, he's a really good player. When you throw the ball to Trey, he's going to catch it now. You just get it close, and he's a little bit faster than what people give him credit for. So you know, he's a guy that, that's going to – I think this is going to be the year where people look at him when you talk about Michigan State offense, and he's going to – might be the first name that comes to mind. I like that. There's There was someone defensively when we had you last year that, and you had a couple of studs on that side, no no doubt, but there was one guy in particular that every time we talked to you, you're like, this guy, this guy just always making the right play, Cal Halliday. Oh yeah, the body man. Yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. What has always been the thing that when you watch him, you're like, man, this kid's unbelievable. Well, first, he's the, he's the ultimate no flare guy. He wears no, no extra anything. I mean, he's old school. I mean, it's the hundred years of, of uh, Michigan State football in Spartan Stadium, he could have played a hundred years ago. I mean, he is old school. But the thing about him is he's very, very consistent and he's, he's very instinctive and he finds a way to get to the ball and make the play. And it doesn't have to be perfect, you know, but he's going to find a way to get it done. That's what good linebackers do. No doubt, no doubt. You mentioned a hundred years of Spartan football. If you had a Mount Rushmore, of Michigan State athletes. They don't even have to just be football players. I'll put you a little bit on the spot. Could you come up with them? Oh, that would be tough. That's I mean, hard. that'd be really hard. I mean, because there's, there's some great ones. I mean, but if you, I mean, like, I, I played golf with Kurt Gibson the other day. You know, he got around legend. four or three. He's a legend. He was a great, I mean, great receiver. I mean, uh, you know, I saw Lorenzo White the other day. I mean, I mean, you know, we got Darius Snow is on our team, his uncle's Percy Snow. And then not to mention, like, I mean, I get calls from Jimmy Ray at times, the first black quarterback from the South to win a national championship. I mean, Bubba Smith, it goes on and on. Bubba Pisa, I mean, I mean, where does it stop? I mean, there's a lot of great Spartans. I, I don't think that I could do it justice. No, it's like asking your favorite movie. There's too many to choose from. I'm with you there. I'm with you.